Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me, as always, is a man that sometimes has NyQuil for dinner. He is the captain. It's the original purple drink. It's good to be seen, and it's good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. This week, we are drinking Heart of Lothian by Drop-In Brewing Company in Middlebury, Vermont. Garage grade four and a half bottle caps out of five. This is a Scottish ale crafted to resemble a 90 shilling ale of Scotland in the 1920s. It is a delicious medium bodied ale, dark brown in color and finishes dry. When you have a pint of this bad boy, you will follow it up with another. And today's beer was brought to us by these bad boys and girls. First up, we have Chandler, Alex and Bryce from Covington, Georgia. And Captain, we also have Milo, who I think is a human. <laughs> but we also have Phoebe, who is a dog. Wait, we don't have a shout out to Ross and Rachel or Joey and Monica? No, but that's on them, Captain. We do have a shout out for Heather and Groveport, good old OH. I O. I O, that's right. Next up, we have Leslie. She says she's the OG Jersey girl in Burleson, Texas. And a big shout out to Courtney, which would like for us to try some angry orchard on the show and we also have holly from wellington new zealand thanks to everybody for filling up the fridge for this week's show if you want to help us out with next week's show go to truecrimegarage.com and click on the donate button and for everything true crime garage check out truecrimegarage.com and sign up on our mailing list and that's enough of the beers nails thank you captain everybody gather around grab a chair grab a beer let's talk some true crime Brianna's parents, the Maitlands, fielded hundreds of tips about Brianna's possible whereabouts in the days and weeks after her disappearance. And they heard it all. You know, she was kidnapped and killed, or she was tied to a tree. She was in a lake. She was fed to hogs. But about a month after Brianna disappeared, an anonymous phone call came in to Bruce Maitland that said Brianna was being held in a cellar at a farmhouse on Reservoir Road in Berkshire which is just about 15 minutes away from the Black Lantern Inn. At Bruce's insistence on April 15, 2004, police went to the house in question and found that the house was occupied by none other than Ryans and Jackson, the last names of the two drug dealers that we had discussed in the first episode. A young local couple was also present at this home. These are two individuals, both 17 years old at the time. Now, police were granted permission to search the premises and saw in plain sight drug paraphernalia, cocaine, pot, and drugs. But there was no sign of Brianna. And the house didn't even have a cellar. Right. Police arrested all four present and questioned them. They all professed to know Brianna, but no one knew where she was or what had happened to her. They were arraigned and released, and Jackson and Ryan... They actually left the area shortly after this occurred. It's unknown who made the anonymous call alleging Brianna was at the house. In July of 2004, Brianna's parents and their private investigators sifted through rumors about their daughter's disappearance. One thing they heard from multiple sources was Brianna's body could be found in a manure pit on a farm in Sheldon. The manure pit was drained Uh, Brianna was not in it. Uh, The Maitlands also followed up on tips, taking them to New York City and other places. They even borrowed an underwater slash underground camera to search parts of the area, which included a river. Um, And the river in question actually had portions that were 
were now ice free by the time these searches were being conducted uh, that would have had ice there when Brianna disappeared. Right. Brianna's parents accepted help from an organization that helps to find missing persons. This group is MJA Incorporated. Uh, and this is an investigations group that is self-funded and does not charge the families for work done on their behalf. MJA personnel claims to have found some items in a ditch under some brush near the crime scene. And when we say crime scene, we mean where her vehicle was found. These were a pair of Victoria's secret underwear matching Brianna's size. There was a syringe found as well and some zip ties with hair in them. MJA turned all of these items over to the Vermont State Police. If tests were ever run on the syringe, zip ties, or underwear, we are never told of these results. Right. But in October of 2004, two MJA employees processed Brianna's car after it was released by the Vermont State Police Lab. According to Mark Harper of MJA, he found traces of vomit on the doorframe of the car on both sides. A light blue syringe cap was also found, and a minute traces of blood um, were found using a black light. Well, they believed that the syringe cap matched the syringe that they found in the ditch. They also found three green fibers, possibly from the trim of a jacket or a cuff or hem. That this didn't seem to; these fibers didn't seem to match anything found at Brianna's home or where she was staying. So. What we mean by this indication is that these fibers could have come from somebody else right. other than from something that Brianna was wearing. Now, what MJA proclaims to have found in the car has been met with significant skepticism. The thing here is you you have to wonder how unlikely it may have been for the Vermont State Police to have missed all of this evidence. I'm not saying that they would have missed some of it or any one piece of this evidence It seems difficult for me to believe that they would have missed all of this evidence inside the small confines of that car. Well, they also claim that there was still fingerprint tape that was left from law enforcement that looked like there was fingerprints that they could, you know, like when they pulled off the tape that they could see fingerprints and why weren't those taken and why weren't those processed is what basically MJ a is claiming. Yes. And I saw that report as well. I left out the fingerprint information because of the rebuttal by the Vermont state police stating that those were deemed to be unusable prints for whatever reason. Yeah. I think they said they were unreadable. There you go. Um, so here's the thing or, you know, regarding this evidence or possible, we should say possible evidence as to what had happened. It's hard to believe that they missed all of it, but let's say that they did. Or let's say that they found it and for whatever reason deemed it to be unrelated because this car was in their possession for quite some time before MJA was able to process the car. Right. So regarding the the vomit, the blood, any thoughts there, Captain, of of what you you feel? Because here's what my gut tells me regarding the fibers. Okay, so these fibers are, are rather small. Um, as we said, it's likely they did not come from Brianna, right. but this car is almost 20 years old and it's the inside as we described it, there's, there's litter and trash all over this car. Yeah. It looks like somebody's either living out of this car or that they just use their car as a trash can. Yeah. So it becomes very difficult to, and again, I, I believe law enforcement when they say, Hey, these are unreadable prints. But when you say that you found vomit, well, dried vomit, well, was this something that happened a month before she went missing and she just didn't clean it up? I mean, there's cans of tuna. There's trash everywhere. Mm -hmm. So one night you get a little drunk and you throw up and you clean most of it up and there's some um, residue left over. Yeah. Or you're sick and you get sick. Um, the blood, as far as I'm concerned, same thing. I kind of lump all these three things together, the vomit, the blood, and well, the green fibers. It. Well, but you could test the blood to find out if it's hers. Right. You know. But what I mean by this is not, not look, you, it could go either way. Obviously we don't know. We just don't know. It could right. actually be evidence of something or 
this car is 20 years old and it wasn't well kept on the inside of this vehicle. Like you said, any of this stuff could have come from not just days or weeks before, but it could have come even years before for all we know. I, it doesn't look like they were in the habit of cleaning out the inside of this vehicle. Right. So there's a decent chance, at least in my mind that there's a possibility that all three of these items have literally zero connection to what actually happened. And there has never been a real connection established between uh, the victim and the underwear that was found in the ditch. Right. And we don't, again, I mean, when you have needles involved and you have rumors of drug use, you then question, and then you have the zip ties. Are you using the zip tie to tie your arm off, you know, to inject something into you? Are Mm. you using the underwear to tie your arm off? Um, These are possibilities when there's rumors of drug use. So we have Harper. He's the uh, independent investigator that quote unquote found um, things in the vehicle. And he would state that he found enough things in the vehicle to back up his theory. And his theory is that Brianna was the victim of a serial killer operating in the area who leaves little to no trace of evidence behind basing this on, he based this off of footprints found on takeout containers on the floor of her car and the rear view mirror supposedly being bent backwards, stating that he believes that there was some kind of struggle that took place in the vehicle that started in the front seat and may have moved to the back seat and then to the outside of the vehicle. He states that he believes that Brianna was ultimately subdued by using a hot shot or a quick dose of an incapacitating drug, and then the killer abducted and killed her. And he'd use that with the syringe? Yes. Okay. So, again, but, though, I but, have... But you have a guy that is supposedly a serial killer that doesn't leave behind evidence, and he's leaving behind a syringe? Right. So, But it's possible. I mean, we've seen plenty of serial killers start killing people and get very sloppy. It is very possible, but again, the evidence that he points to to suggest this theory, I call in a question, again, footprints on containers that were in the vehicle. I mean, if, if, if he could tell me that those containers didn't make their way into that vehicle until like 24 hours before she disappeared, then maybe I'll believe that those footprints had something to do with her disappearance. But again, just like well, all the other can- items we discussed, those containers could have been in that car for a year. Right. But for all the, we know, if they're boot prints or whatever, and then you go, okay, well we have, we know that this killer wears this type of boot. Uh, that's, but um, how are we going to know that that killer wears that type of boot? He's I'm just going off of his words. I don't have a whole I'm lot just, of I'm saying, information on this theory. I'm just using the thought that right. he says that this, this serial killer leaves no evidence behind. Right. But when, when the guy says, hey, there's some evidence, we got these footprints, do those footprints match another case? And if they do, then I think you have to keep an open mind to that could be a possibility. I mean, she's only, you know, a, a mile and a half, less than a mile and a half from right. her, her work where she left. That That's very strange. I mean, could she have picked somebody up? You know, mm-hmm. did she pick somebody up in the parking lot before she left? Um, those are all possibilities. The other thing I wonder while we're on the topic and we'll get back to the car again, because there's a lot to talk about with the car, I feel. But the thing I wonder too here, Captain, is it something as innocent on, on Brianna's behalf? Could she have pulled off the road thinking she either forgot something at work or needed to turn around to go to a different direction for any number of reasons, pull off the road and then, kind of slammed it into reverse and accidentally backed into the side of the, right. we've all had accidents. Right. Yeah. So very possible. Or one of my thoughts too was, you know, she gets off work. If these drug rumors are true, if the heavy drug use is true, is she leaving work and pulling off the side of the road to do some drugs real quick? And this is a banded area, and then you do a little drugs, and then for whatever reason, she gets a little freaked out. Oh, man, I got to get out of here. Mm-hmm. Or maybe a cop drives by or a couple cars drive by. She starts getting freaked out. I got to get out of here. Throws it into reverse, hits the barn. 
Well, um, after after about a year went by, we do have some of Brianna's family would say that they were starting to give up hope that she would ever be found alive, but they did still continue to search for her. But then years would go by. Yeah. And in 2007, Brianna's parents moved away from the area to New York, to the state of New York. Well, and let's dive into that a little bit more because you're of the mind and I've been of the mind too. If you have a missing person in your family, you don't want to leave the area. Mm-hmm. But during the investigation, it came out that um, Brianna was molested by an 18-year-old male. Uh, I believe that neighbor. Ma- yeah, I believe that male was a direct neighbor and the family was getting threats. Uh, the family was getting, there was just a lot of stuff happening. And plus now you're, you have this information you didn't have before about a neighbor and now you have to see that person's a very small town. So th- this is one of the cases of a missing person where when somebody says we left because things were getting bad, uh, I believe them. Uh, Mm -hmm. We've seen it in so many other cases where somebody is actually a suspect in the person going missing and they, they jump town. I'm always suspicious of that, but I'm not suspicious of it here. Well, and, and like you said, we usually think that's a huge red flag, but that would be, especially in the case of younger missing persons true where true. Brianna being 17 she and here's the vibe I get to captain with Brianna and I and obviously I don't know but I feel like this was a, a young adult you know 17 years old about to be an adult I really feel like this was somebody if she was getting her life on track like her mother says I kind of feel like this is a, a 17 year old going on 25 right you know this was somebody that was ready to venture off into the world and hold herself and carry herself like an adult. Now, the thing that the thing that I also found too regarding this, and you put it in a in better, more detailed terms, was that we have Bruce, I'm Batman, her father. He said in the course of his searches for his daughter, he confronted a lot of people demanding to know whether they knew anything. And this created a lot of enemies for him and his family. And as you pointed out, uh, they received threats uh, in the process of looking for their daughter. Bruce was working in the forestry industry as well. And he publicly said that the strain on him was, was big time. And this is because he, you know, he'd be out in the woods and finding scraps of clothing in the woods or seeing buzzards circling around. It was like, or if he saw a fire, he would have to check it out. Yeah, he, I mean, he he's at work and he can't get away. Years later, he can't yeah. get a, away from this. Could this could have something to do with my daughter's disappearance, or this really? this could be finding my daughter today while I'm at work? Well, it really makes you feel bad for the family, and I think in a lot of these cases we see, um, you know, they're just talk about the victim, but we don't talk so much about. I mean, the effect that this has on the family members is is devastating. It's life-changing forever. Let's get into some of the rumors because we've kind of been circling around this, and but there are some very, that, uh, very specific rumors that have raised questions in this case. The first, according to several inside sources, a lime wedge was found on the trunk of Brianna's car. Right. This, despite the car having backed into the barn or the, the, I'm sorry, the farmhouse and a portion of that farmhouse collapsing onto the trunk of the car. Right. So it's not known exactly where this lime was found. The lime gave rise to a slew of rumors that there was a party at the Dutch burn house that night. There is quite a bit of debate whether people hung out at that house, at that abandoned house. We do know that a gun and drug paraphernalia was found inside there. Um, Could this have been a possible meeting place for teenagers or used by dealers or a a meetup spot? Right. Um, But on the other hand, here's the thing. On the other side of the coin, Captain, it seems a bit weird to me. It seems to make little sense to me for illegal activities to be conducted at what I would consider to be such a visible spot 
on a well-traveled road. And what I mean by that is her car is only there for a limited time. And we have several people stating, Hey, I saw her car there that night. Right. There's no evidence of a party. And what I mean by that is we have eyewitnesses that saw her car. We don't have a single eyewitness that I've seen or that I've read about that saw multiple cars there where there was a party. Right. Now it could be that again, could it, is it possible that she met people after work and they decided, well, let's go down to this barn and, and do some drugs and have a little, little tiny party. That is possible. Mm -hmm. Uh, but again, there's no evidence of that. Well, like you pointed out earlier, she's less than a mile and a half away from the black lantern Inn. Yeah. This is a bar and restaurant where I would expect to see and find lime wedges. Yeah, you put the lime in the coconut. And we already reported that the low temperature that night was 8 degrees. Right. A lot of people argue that this lime would be in contact with alcohol, so therefore it wouldn't freeze. And that's also not true, just also depending on, like, isn't the proof, isn't there something to do with the proof that... Yeah, so the alcohol by volume would would be in direct relation to whether it would freeze or not. Right. And again, this wouldn't have to be in contact. Somebody could just have lime in water or whatever, or it could be somebody, some people like to cut up the limes uh, or the lemons and, and, and chew on them and eat them. So is it possible somebody was out by her car or was somebody just being a jerk and threw it and it hit her car and, she didn't even know it was there. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's uh Well, if it was discarded after somebody was done with their drink or if somebody kind of you know, you you just kind of you toss out the drink with keeping the the glass right. in your hand, if that were to occur, I would assume that if, if this is a mixed drink and that's what I would expect to find a lime on um or in if they were discarding their drink, it could be that it was the drink was considerably watered down by that point. And again, like I said, the low temperature that night is eight degrees. We know that we, kn we have to believe that she wrecked her car between the time of leaving work, which is about 1130 at night, and between the, it, the first sighting of the vehicle, yeah. which was just midnight or one o'clock, depending on how you read that report. So that's, that's a half an hour to an hour and a half later. And at that time of night... I'm going to expect it to be very close to the lowest temperature of the night. Right. Again, if the lime is on her, on the roof of her car, and we're also talking about, uh, it's a big trunk. Yeah. So it's not like the small trunks that we have today. So she hits the, this building or whoever hits the building. And the, even if the lime moves a little bit, it could still stay on the trunk. I think it has nothing to do with this case. I think, it's simply she worked at a bar. She was a mile and a half from the bar. I'm sure there's constantly th things put on her car. I, I don't think it has much to do with anything. I had one time when uh, when I was married that I was digging a ditch and I needed to go to the store to get a new shovel. And I took my I had my ring off while I was digging and it was on the back of my car on the bumper. I drove miles, went to the store, then drove miles back. And luckily the the ring stayed on the car, but so I, I just don't put a lot of weight into this whole lime thing. If it was even there, we got it. We got to keep in mind that this is a, we're going through the rumor section of what was going on. I'll so just assume that it, it seems like true. a strange thing for someone to just make up. So let's right. go with that. It was true. But again, I'm going to go back to, she was coming from a place where I would expect to be many lime wedges. You know, it's a bar, it's a restaurant. You know, I think that it was likely frozen to the vehicle before she even left there. Now, another rumor in the case that has been central to this case has to do with a story told by Brianna's mother that Brianna seems to have seen someone or something that day when they were at the mall, the same day that she went missing, that, that shook her up. Yeah, I remember there, she had this uh, thing happen where Brianna went into the parking lot, then came back and she was shooken up. So one witness much later told Maitland family private investigator that he had been told by someone unnamed that this individual went to the mall and warned 
Brianna to not go to work that night. Right. So, I mean, I, I guess this would go probably go back to something we talked about on yesterday's show. Did she, has she made some type of enemy or did she owe somebody money or was this something to do with the local drug scene? Right. Or the girl that punched her in the face multiple times. The other thing too, that the, the true du- two drug dealers that we've discussed on the show, that there seems to be some possible connection, if not directly with Brianna or would have been with maybe some of the people she, some of the circles she ran in right. would be this Ryan's and Jackson character. Here's the thing. Okay. I got to believe, look, in a lot of these cases that we've covered, especially when we go back to like the sixties or seventies, there's always the rumor of, well, so-and-so must've owed a drug dealer money and they didn't pay up. So the dealer came after him and killed him. Right. Okay. Let's think about that for a second. Now I understand that crazy things do happen and that mathematically not everything always works out, but can we just agree that the overwhelming majority of the time when, when a situation like that goes down, it's because somebody owes a considerable amount of money or a considerable amount of drugs to someone. A, a, a pot dealer doesn't go after somebody for a hundred bucks and kill them. It just, it, it, it does not happen. Oh, well, it depends on how you run the streets, you know? No, but can can we agree? I think as a whole, as all of the garage army, I think we need to just agree that that's not the way that these things go down. So but that's not how I run my streets. Well, th- that's fine. But the thing, what I'm, what I'm trying to get at here is then if we have to under, if we, we go down the thought of her being killed for drug money or a debt that, that was owed to drug dealers, right? That also means that those drug dealers permitted Brianna to rack up a huge debt. That typically doesn't happen. Usually, often, when somebody sells somebody something or fronts them something, if they're not paid for it, they don't front them again and again and again and again and again. Right, but this also, I mean, we have rumors that she was doing not just smoking pot, but you know, possibly smoking crack and then on top of that getting a job the the rumor was that she got the second job to pay off a debt right but i i don't know how that counters what i was saying about racking up a a large debt oh but you could rack up it it might not be over and over it could have been a one-time thing where this person felt like hey we're pretty you know not only are you buying drugs from me but we're friends all you need this much coke or you need this much whatever and or maybe heck for all we know the the it was she was going to sell it for him or something and something went bad she owed him a bunch of money right i know i agree with that um but it, i agree with your theory that a drug dealer is not going to let her rack up a debt over right. a period of time what i'm saying is there is that possibility of a hey, one-time thing you know because this is a 17 year old that's living on their own and needs money. Right. So, well, and then on top of that though, so as far as the drugs that we mentioned, uh, as being, well, not just mentioned, but what we know was being brought into the area. Most of those, you would have to sell a, a huge quantity for them to be expensive. You know, the only expensive drug in that list is cocaine. Right. And usually people don't front somebody, you know, hundreds of dollars or thousands of dollars of cocaine, especially somebody they don't know very well. Well, a guy might to a pretty girl. The other thing we have to consider too, is if somebody owes a debt to a drug dealer, if you kill the person that owes the debt, you can't collect on that debt. Make sure you check out the website store and get your Band the Van t-shirt today. That's right. With your help. With your help. We could ban all the white vans. All the creeper vans. Maybe by 2019, there would be no creeper vans on the street. It's probably not going to happen. We're, what we have mapped out, what our plan is for, 
is we got to take this money and reinvest it. And maybe by 2049, they'll be all gone. Can I advise all the owners and operators of white creeper vans out there to go to the website store page, purchase a shirt and wear it anytime you are operating your creeper van so that the people that see you operating this van know that you're one of the good people. Yes. This is a good is, person. <laughs> this is also a perfect shirt for soccer moms as well. There you go. So let's get into, um, I know we've already touched on some of the theories here, captain, but there are some that we've not really dove into yet. And one that really speaking of creeper van, let's take out the van part. This theory really creeps the hell out of me and probably a lot of others out there. And this was a very popular theory early on that someone was hiding in the backseat of Brianna's car while she was at work. And as she drove down East Berkshire road was attacked and maybe the attack caused the accident somehow into the abandoned house. And then this person hiding in her car abducted her. Yeah. Possible. I mean, we, again, we have the rumors of the threats being made to not go to work. She goes to work anyways because she needs the money. And then the person that maybe threatens her or the group of people that threatens her goes, hey, we're going to teach her a lesson. When she gets in the car, we'll be waiting. And I know that sounds very urban legend-ish, right? But we do have Bruce Maitland. He initially embraced this theory. And police did say that it's still considered a possibility to this day. So did the perp wait in the car and wait for her to pull off? away from work. There's a couple things that might be tricky about that. We don't know how long her shift was that day or when this person would have entered the vehicle. We do know it was very cold out that night. It seems like, um, (laughs) somebody sitting there quite bored and quite cold for maybe hours waiting for this individual to return. Well, that's why I would think it would be involved with the threats because there's the people that were making threats to her would know what time she was starting and possibly what time she'd be ending as well. You also have to, you bring up a good um, possibility. Could someone, you have to wonder, could somebody go into the establishment and get a feel for when she might be leaving that night and not have to wait out there in the cold? Right. The other thought too, and this was a theory that is interesting. We have, the thought that Brianna was ambushed by multiple people with some type of roadblock that may have forced her to pull over. And then she was taken from that abandoned house area. This to me seems less likely than the perpetrator hiding in her car. The only reason why I say that is because the way this theory is reads implies multiple individuals working together. We already discussed that this is an area with no cell service. This would further complicate individuals working together plus that we never hear of any evidence or could find of any evidence stating that there were skid marks on the road right but if we want to talk all these possible you know crazy possibilities there's people it's the threats not coming from one person the threats coming from multiple people we know that that is something that spooked her we know that they didn't want her to go to work for whatever reason That's evidence we do have. So if these individuals didn't want her to go to work, who knows why, right? Or, but, but, but a warning doesn't, it could be either way. It could be somebody saying, we don't, you know, we don't want her to go to work for whatever reason, or someone that knows of something that could be going down and trying to say, Hey, it's unsafe for you to go to work. Right. I, but I think most people believe the threat that was made while she was shopping was, you don't go to work. Not that something's bad's going to happen. Like you mm-hmm. better not do that. Mm-hmm. So she goes to work. Could somebody be in the back seat of her car? Possibly. Could somebody be? Uh, could they uh, run her off the road? Possibly. Could right. they set up a roadblock? Possibly. Could somebody be in the back seat of her car and they set up a roadblock? Also, the, all these things are possible. I think. We just have such lack of evidence of these things. I think that you're right there. And I, I would agree with if I had to pick one or two of those being as being more likely, the roadblock is the one to me that doesn't make a lot of sense because we've already discussed that 
This, well, the reason why it makes sense, though, is it's the reversing and hitting the barn from reverse. And if you set up a roadblock, like maybe you'd be like, what the hell is happening here? And then you'd slow down. But once you slow down enough where you'd see who was in the cars of the roadblock or who was out of the cars of the roadblock, then you might punch it back into gear because you're going to have to hit this barn going 35, 40 miles an hour. And that's pretty fast going in reverse. So that's the only reason why that that theory is plausible to me. Yeah, I agree with that. What I meant was that it's a busy road that we've right. we've already discussed how many people we think were traveling on the road after midnight that night. And it, it seems to me like a roadblock would have been tough for to pull off and not have anybody else see it or say, hey, there was some strange activity going on. But just before midnight. Yeah, on I, that road. I agree fully with that. Yeah. Then there's the other theory, and this might be even more plausible, that that Brianna met someone at the abandoned house or near the abandoned house the night that she uh, went missing and was abducted from there. So pointing to the possibility of a struggle inside her car or just outside of her car, her family has stated that they do believe that there was a possible struggle at this scene. Some investigators believe that there may have been a violent confrontation inside the vehicle. We discussed that earlier. This based on the, the lights and the blinkers going on and off. So things scattered around inside and outside of the car, as well as those reports about the lights being on, the blinkers being on, the blinkers not being on. There is the report from the police that states a broken piece of jewelry was found outside of the vehicle. Again, here's what I would like to hear in this situation. A broken piece of jewelry was found outside of the vehicle. We know that the officer picked it up, assumed that it came from the vehicle, so he put it back in the vehicle and then had the vehicle towed, right? Can we get anybody, friends or family, to say, yes, that was a piece of her jewelry? Right. Because just like what we discussed about the vehicle being almost 20 years old and items inside of it could have been there for years, for months, for weeks... That broken piece of jewelry could have just happened to landed there years ago, you know, or months ago. Right. If you could prove it was hers, it leans, that evidence leans towards the idea that there would be a struggle at that scene. What I think points more towards a a direct connection between, uh, to our victim or our missing person is the loose change that is rumored to have been found on the ground outside of where the car would have been. So we talked about what she, we do know that she wore to work that night, that apron that had pockets on the outside of it. Uh We, we don't have family or friends to tell us what else she was wearing that night, but here just a general thought is either she still has that apron on, or maybe it's on her lap and either through the course of some kind of struggle or even just the simple act of getting out of the vehicle at that scene of the abandoned house could cause loose change to come out of those pockets and fall onto the the ground there. What I'm getting at with this is you're saying, well, what does that point to? To me, that kind of points to Brianna could have very likely or was very likely at that scene that night. So let's go back to 2006 for a minute. This is when the Maitland started to work with a private investigator named Greg Overacker. The Maitlands were very frustrated with what they perceived as a lack of progress in the case. And at about the same time, they're getting assisted by Kelly Maitland's sister, Tammy. They have their website up and going, right? And they're receiving several tips. And some of these tips are about a man called the Joker. Now, according to tips, the Joker, whom police later identified as Jorge Soto, 26 years old of Springfield, Massachusetts, was an associate of Raymond Ryan's and Nathaniel Jackson, the two uh, very well-known drug dealers by our listeners at this point. Soto reportedly bragged repeatedly that he had killed Brianna. People in Richford said that Soto was notorious in their town for having, quote, strangled a puppy to death at a party with his bare hands, end quote. This is believed because its barking got on his nerves. When the police questioned Soto about his boastings concerning Brianna, he told them that his claims were only bravado made up to make him quote, appear big and mean end quote in the eyes of those that he dealt drugs to. Right. But he was big and mean. 
well, he, he was certainly mean. I didn't see the size of this man, but I'll, I'll go on your word. Um, but even after police questioned him, Soto reportedly continued to tell people that he killed Brianna and even told one group of teens he buried her body in a cornfield behind a house he occasionally occupied. So the the thing here is that I did see someone, and this is tough because I couldn't find the actual information myself, but I found someone discussing that Soto was actually arrested and put in jail prior to Brianna's disappearance. And he was, he was released the day before she disappeared. Yes. So I went down that trail and I was thinking, well, this person's going to say that he was locked up and he couldn't have done anything to Brianna. But according to this source, which I've not been able to verify, Mm -hmm. he, he was arrested, but was in fact released just the day before he would have been somewhat in this area is the thing that we do know at the time of her disappearance. Right. I wonder if there's any, well, they probably didn't ask, but I wonder if, what if he went to that bar that night, saw her, he knows her through her other drug dealer connections. Mm -hmm. Hey, can you give me a ride that, you know, and, but there's nothing that I have found that puts him in that town that day. But right. That, and law enforcement, I think their claim is we would have known if he's in town. Eh, you wouldn't know. There's 13 of you. Right. <laughs> You'd know if he's in town for a while, but you wouldn't know the minute he had. There's not some radar that goes off. So it's definitely possible. I think it's very creepy. And you got to be a giant piece of shit to walk around telling people that you're responsible for this. Uh, and then when the cops come up on you, you say, ah, oh, I'm just bragging to, you know, to make myself look bigger. Well, and then go back to stating that you did kill her after you're done talking to the police. Right. But they, they need to follow up on some of these rumors. I mean, if he's talking about burying her in this cornfield, you know, how much does it cost to get cadaver dogs to go out and, and search? It would seem to me like I can come to two conclusions regarding Jorge Soto or the Joker, right? We, we either have an individual that actually killed Brianna or we have a guy that's a freaking moron. Okay. That's the only two conclusions I can come to with this guy. Now he's both according to Greg Overacker, um, the private investigator, he stated that Soto eventually ended up being sent to a mental health facility and to prison as well. The other prevailing theory Another prevailing theory, I should say, that while questioning locals, friends, and acquaintances of Brianna, Greg Overacker repeatedly heard the following story. There was a late night party in Richford the night Brianna disappeared. Overacker was told Brianna attended and something horrible happened to her at the party. Some people said she was killed at the party. Others said she overdosed. Others said she was deliberately overdosed. Right. Several reports that Overacker heard had Brianna's body disposed of, quote, on a farm somewhere in Franklin County. So under this theory, she would have attended the party after crashing the car, in my opinion. The time frame between the witnesses seeing her uh, leave work and then seeing the car around 12 to 1 o'clock. Right. It's, it seems likely that this is too short of a time period for her to have gone to the party OD'd, and someone then ditched the car at the Dutch burn place before the witnesses saw the car. So if this is the case, then does the car crashing into the barn have anything to do with what happened to Brianna? It seems unlikely that the car crash is just incidental in my opinion. And then her going to a party and dying of a drug overdose that same night. Right. Brianna's friend Katie believes that at least four locals know exactly what happened that night. One was someone she considered a friend until he told her he was present when he witnessed, quote, the light leave Brianna's eyes. Brianna's friend Megan, who says Brianna was involved in drugs, also believes that Brianna OD'd and that the locals covered it up to hide the lethal overdose by a minor and their own involvement. 
Other possibilities that have been raised over the years, we have a situation where Bruce and Kelly Maitland received a confidential tip concerning a 32-year-old Burlington man named Gerald Montgomery. The tipster told the Maitlands that Montgomery was an associate of Ryan's and Jackson. We'll get into the story, but one thing I want to point out here, Captain, there's a lot of rumors going on about what could have happened to this girl. Doesn't it seem crazy that most of them seem to... The names Ryan and Jackson keep coming back up. Yeah. That they're but, they're either associates or they know or they were involved in somehow. Well, and all the rumors about her drug use. If if you believe on one side that she was cleaning herself up or if you believe that she was getting more into it or depending on it's a, depending on what kind of habit you think she had. Obviously, people she's getting drugs from play a part in that. And they're going to play a part in a lot of different scenarios. I gotcha. I gotcha. It's it's like if drugs, if you believe drugs were any way involved at all right, in because, her life, then the two she, well-known drug dealers are are in the storytelling. Right. Because somehow. if she's doing crack or heroin from these guys and she does these drugs that night and she dies from an OD, well, guess who the cops are also going to come after? Yeah. The people with the bad drugs. So. So. Regarding this Gerald Montgomery, the tipster said that um, that he had something to do with this. Now, the Maitlands are already aware of Montgomery at this point, I would believe. And this would be through newspapers because in March of 2005, Montgomery raped, beat, and strangled to death a 31-year-old woman. This is Laura Winterbottom. Um, the rape murder took place in a vehicle on Burlington Street. After his arrest, it was learned that Montgomery worked in Burlington, worked in a Burlington elementary school, but was conv- a convicted sex offender in New York. So he was a convicted sex offender in New York and then moved to the Vermont area and started working in the school before he killed this woman. Yeah. I don't know the details of, of him being involved in Brianna's case or leading to her disappearance just this is somebody that we know is capable of murder and it sounds like he was in the immediate area at the time in 2008 the vermont state police issued a press release saying the following investigators believe that there is a strong indication that brianna is in fact a victim of foul play there is no evidence at all at this time to indicate that brianna willingly left the area so it sounds to me like in 2008, the Vermont State Police were kind of back to square one in a sense, because square one started off being that they thought that she was either uh, some kind of runaway or just an irresponsible teenager that would turn up eventually. Right. So in 2015, a Canadian investigative journalist named Tarek started looking into the case. Now, Tarek says He's 100% certain that Brianna's disappearance was drug related, although not because she owed a debt. She was quote made to disappear by several people in that business, not just a random killer, but people said, you know, but people she knew according to Tarek, Tarek believes that the murder was planned, that Brianna was warned about it that day at the mall. And she chose to ignore the warning. Both Overacker, he's the private investigator, and Tarek agree that there is a conspiracy of silence around this case and agree to some extent about Brianna's fate. Overacker thinks that at least three people know directly what happened to Brianna, but it may be a group different from Ryan's and Jackson, the two drug dealers. So in other words, that locals were involved. He says up to 15 people likely have information on the case. Looking into this case recently, Overacker heard from an informant that a car followed Brianna that night from the Black Lantern Inn, forced her to pull over, and grabbed her. According to this informant, multiple people were at the Dutch Burn house when Brianna was taken and the car was disposed of, or wanted to be disposed of. The informant told Overacker that a tall male attempted to drive the car, but his knees got in the way and he accidentally crashed it into the side of the abandoned house. These people all were complicit in or had knowledge of Brianna's death and disposal. The informant was not a, was not 
local to this case, but moved in the same circles as those responsible. He said that Brianna was buried on a piece of property, a private property somewhere in the area. Now we would be remiss if we didn't discuss a possible case connection, right? Captain, there is one other theory that has now been, well, some, yeah, I think it's some a- would say it's been debunked by law enforcement and Brianna's family, but it's an intriguing one and one that we should mention. Part of the reason that Brianna's case received so much attention from the media and the public from the get go was because it seemed all too familiar. There is another case of a young woman taking off in her car destination, maybe unknown, crashing it in the dark rural road in the upper New England area and vanishing from the face of the earth. Yeah. And of, in fact, this case took place only 90 miles away from where Brianna went missing and it occurred just five weeks earlier. And yes, we are talking about Mara Murray. Let me just start off with the whole idea of only 90 miles. If you said, Hey, uh, I'm moving. Don't worry. It's only 90 miles away. That's, that's a far distance. Yeah. And remember we had this when we discussed the case of the two murdered ladies that were both out jogging and they were killed within like, sorry, I don't have my notes in front of me, but it would have been like a roughly a week of one another. And they both happen to be out jogging when, when they were attacked by, by separate individuals. Right. The cases were not related at all, but they were in the general same area of the country. And they were both doing the same activity when they were attacked. Those cases had nothing to do with one another. One thing I will say here though, that, that I I think it's appropriate to get into it here is that I do understand the math. You know, everybody says regarding Mara Murray and they say it as well with Brianna Maitland's case. Well, that's because you went to school for a computer. No, but they say the math. Do you understand the mathematics of someone happening to, they happen to be in an accident and before they could get to safety or get to another location, they cross paths with a serial killer. Yes, I understand how ridiculous that would be, the probability of that happening. And then let's factor in that it was the same serial killer. That is as close to, I mean, we're not even talking about lightning striking twice. We're talking about something even more improbable than that. But what is far more likely is that the two could have ended with the similar fate. Right. We could have a situation here where both did accidentally crash their cars and they crossed path with cross paths with a killer, someone that would go on to attack, abduct and kill them. Not necessarily the same individual. And what I mean by that is, We've covered enough cases, Captain. We've seen plenty of times where somebody, they didn't wake up that day with the intention of abducting, attacking, and killing somebody. But by the end of their day, that's what happened for whatever reason. And maybe it's because they came across the, their eventual victim just by happenstance. Right. So if there is any relationship between these two cases, in my opinion, would be that it's just a similar set of circumstances. Not that they're in fact related in any other way. So where the case stands today, we have Lieutenant Glenn Hall says cops have worked this case to death, but still can't offer closure to the family. Hall believes that the tips regarding drug abuses, uh, parties and overdoses were exaggerated. And there is no real evidence that Brianna was involved in the drug scene as the rumors claim. He stated in 2014 that authorities do have quote, persons of interest in the case. But in a surprise revelation reported by WCAX in March of 2016, police indicated that they have DNA evidence obtained from Brianna's vehicle and that they continue to work the case as a case of missing of a missing person Uh, with suspected to hear that, though, with suspected foul play. As of March 2018, the Vermont State Police say that the case is still active with several leads, but no clear suspect. So what are your thoughts on the this case here, Captain? Well, this one is very difficult 
I think for two reasons. One, that you can basically take all the actual evidence and put it on a very small piece of paper. The amount of rumors. You could put the actual evidence on the lime wedge. Probably. Yes. And then you could fill a whole book with the rumors. Yeah. And and that's what makes this very difficult. And and the reason why it's similar to the Mara Murray case to me is you have all these things like the lime wedge, like the, the way the car was crashed. Mm-hmm. The, her going to work, these possible threats, you have all these things that they m- might mean everything or they could mean nothing. And, and, and probably I, mathematically, you would have to wager that the majority of these things likely mean nothing. Right. I, I, I do put a little more weight. Um, I've heard some of the private investigators and some uh, armchair detectives talking about the rumors that the friends have came forward. I mean, it's been years later, you know, she's since she's gone missing and now you have some of her really close friends that are coming forward. And to me, it's almost, um, they're trying to get something off their chest. I don't think the rumors were that the friends were there, but they know of people that uh, Brianna was with. I, I put a little bit more weight into those, um, confessions, if you will. Mm hmm. Uh, than I think most of the other people because they're going, well, what they're saying makes sense, but the scene at the car doesn't make any sense. And I don't think necessarily they have to go hand in hand. So we might not be able to explain the car crash. We might be able to explain this one in. I put a little more weight into what they're saying, Um, but this one is a big, I, I don't know. I agree with that, and I think a big problem, like you stated, not just the rumors, but there's also so many different people rumored to have been involved, and that makes it extremely difficult. The other thing that I find crazy is we're not talking, we shouldn't be talking about a large circle of people coming forward. We already said there's only like 900 people in the town total, so the amount of people coming forward, those rumors can't even seem to agree on who the number one suspect is and the number one reason why she would have been killed. Right. You know, so that seems weird to me and not even a clear understanding if she was even involved in drugs, um, on that level at all. I think that, you know, there are several possibilities that I can't walk away from one being that it could be as simple as she intended to turn around on her drive for whatever reason, any number of reasons accidentally wedged her car up on that foundation and she couldn't drive off with that car. And we know that she picked up a a hitchhiker at one time. This is her mom's statement that points to me that she might be willing to get into somebody's car. And that could be somebody that decided to do something terrible at a moment's notice right? for no real reason at all, other than they're a, a complete monster. The other troubling thing, too, is like we pointed out that those two same drug dealers names seem to come up in most of the rumors as to what happened to Brianna. Uh, So you can't discount that, really. The other thought with her ex-boyfriend, James, is weird because he says later that he saw her vehicle. Yeah, we know they have some kind of history. It's unclear to me what his history was with that Keeley girl who I also said, you know, like Bruce Maitland said, has not officially been cleared in his opinion. And I don't think she's officially been cleared in my opinion either. But this James guy, I did come across some rumors that he may not have actually been in Canada that night at all. Uh, But I couldn't find any hardcore proof that that was in fact the case. But those are the rumors. Then the weird thing, this is like the encyclopedia Brown and me that going off on something that's completely likely has nothing to do with the case, but something that is mentioned in the case and doesn't seem to add up or make sense was that she left the note at her friend's house stating that she would return after her shift. I wish we had a little more information on that because what also is reported is that her friend was out of town that weekend and she reported or called the Maitland family to state that, Hey, she's been missing and I've been home since Sunday and now it's Tuesday and I can't find her. I don't know where she is, but 
what I call in a question is if you know your friend is out of town for the weekend, why bother leaving the note stating that you would be back at her place after the, her, your shift? You're telling somebody that's not there that you're going to be there. Right. That seems like a strange thing that, that I wish we had more information on that. Now, in conclusion, you know, so we have the Black Lantern and it did close in 2015. Eventually it would reopen under new ownership. The Dutch burn house eventually burned to the ground in a fire in 2016. Brianna has been missing for 14 years. Many people looking into this case believe that it is likely this case will be solved. Too many people seem to have information on what may have happened to her for it to stay under wraps forever. All it will take is one of them to break the quote conspiracy of silence surrounding this case. Bruce Maitland doesn't believe Brianna is alive any longer. He believes she knew the person who eventually abducted and killed her. He believes that Brianna met someone at the Dutch burn house and there was a struggle. But beyond that, it's all speculation based on evidence that doesn't make a lot of sense. Quote, I don't think this was a random act of being in the wrong place at the wrong time. Maitland told foxnews.com. He said there was something going on in Brianna's life that we don't know about. She had obviously made a connection with someone that may have resulted in what happened to her. All right. We want to thank everybody out there for joining us here in the garage and making us part of your busy week. If you want to get hardcore and be a hardcore garage fan, you can check us out at the Stitcher app and at Stitcher premium. And until next week, go to truecrimegarage.com, pick up your ban the van t-shirt, join in the conversation on our blog. But guess what? You also better be good. You better be kind and please don't let her.